and prayer and uh, perhaps prayer is that reminder like we just sang in that last song, like nothing can stand against the power of our God, right? This is, this is not about us. This is about him and, and the battle belongs to him and all those things we sang and I was thinking about prayer. Uh, there was a quote from uh, Mary, Queen of Scots who said about John Knox, who was a reformer, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than I fear the army of a thousand men. That's pretty, that's pretty epic, isn't it? It's a, it's a reminder, right, that there's a God who is um, more powerful than we can ever dream or imagine, and maybe we've lost sight of how powerful this God is. Maybe we've lost sight of uh, the God who is, uh, is always ready and eager to defend his people, and more than that, defend his cause, his kingdom. And uh, perhaps Exodus is a reminder of that. I know one thing that's going to be true as we journey through Exodus together um, is that we're, I think we're going to capture a, a, an understanding of God perhaps like we've never understood before. And I think it's not only going to encourage us, it's probably going to make us tremble a little bit too. And uh, I'm super excited about this journey we started last week. Uh, because it's really, it's history. Even though Exodus isn't necessarily about us, in a way it is. Um, you know, allegorically or metaphorically pointing to, to a greater deliverer found in Christ. And uh, it is real history that points to a, a God that we also can know. The same God of Moses is the same God of us today. Amen? Amen. And uh, so, uh, you know, someone once said, if we fail to learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. Let me just tell you, first service was a lot better on that quote than you guys were. So um, just saying. And they went to public school too. So um, if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. Um, nothing has changed in 4,000 plus years. Uh, humanity still wrestles with the same stuff, the same sins. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and yet sometimes we still find ourselves... Wondering if God is, is working. We wonder if God's in control. We wonder if God's doing anything. Has anyone ever been to a place in their life? Maybe you're currently there where it's like, God, I don't know how you're going to work this out. I don't even know if you're paying attention. I don't even know if you even know what's happening in my life. But it's easy for all of us to, to wrestle with seasons of despair and discouragement and desperation and depression. And I think Exodus is going to give us a reminder. The same God that defended his people then is the same God who defends his people today. And uh, nothing can stand against the power of our God. Even though they try. They try. They will, uh, they will ultimately fail. And may God be glorified as he is raising up a people, even among us today, who have a deliverer. His name is Jesus. And that Jesus, is uh, he's, he's leading us to something bigger and greater, our promised land one day. And so... Uh, Without further ado, Exodus chapter 1. Turn there in your Bibles if you would. Last week, I, I kind of cheated you guys. I did an intro, and um, we, even, we dealt with one word at the very beginning of Exodus. That's not even in our English Bibles. And I think some of you are like, I don't know what Pastor Scott's smoking, but we're going to double-check this this week to make sure he's, he's right on. I don't know if you double-checked my work. Uh, I hope you do. I hope you double-check kind of what I'm teaching, because don't believe me. Believe the word. But there's a word in our Bibles that's not there, and it's and. The book of Exodus starts with the word and because it's a connecting word because it wants to remind you that what's going on in Exodus is this really a sequel to what's already happened in Genesis. And uh, to understand why Israel ended up in Egypt is an important part of this narrative, this account, right? Um, and if you remember last week, as far as recap is concerned, I'll only take a couple minutes to do this. We looked at uh, some important F words, and it's not the one you're thinking of. Four F words, and it's this, Father favoritism, famine, and forgiveness. The reason Egypt uh, took in Israel is because there was a father named jo Jacob who had a favorite among his kids. Rule number one as a parent, don't play favoritism with your kids. It is always going to turn out disastrous. So uh, Jacob played favorites, made his son a, uh, a coat of many colors, and the other siblings, the other brothers, didn't they didn't fare too well with this decision. Like, oh, dad loves him more than he loves us. And so the brothers decided, let's kill our brother. You know, sibling love. Don't you love it, right? We're going to kill our brother, put him in a pit. He'll get mauled. Uh, we'll return back to dad, say, look at the blood on his coat that you made him. He's, he's, and then they said, no, we actually can make this. This is a business enterprise. We can sell our brother into slavery. And so that's what they do, like loving siblings do. Sell their brother into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. 
right? And there in Egypt, he comes in as a slave, but his wisdom and his ability to interpret Pharaoh's dreams allows him to rise the ranks in politics, becomes the prime minister's second in command, which is awesome. Pharaoh has this dream about a famine. Joseph interprets it, says, here's how, Pharaoh, you can be smart and, and ally yourself in a, such a way that the nations are going to come. They're going to come to you. And because no one else recognizes what's going to happen, you are, and that's exactly what happens. The famine hits the region, and Egypt is the only one positioned with grain. And all the surrounding nations come to them. And who among those nations come? It's, Jake, it's Joseph's family. Because they are starving, and they're like, we, we hear there's grain in Egypt, let's go. Joseph entertains his family, recognizes it as his family. They don't recognize him, he recognizes them. They sit at the table, and then the great reveal happens, and they realize this is our brother, who they probably thought was dead, probably thought he just got lost among the ranks. They did not expect their brother to be prime minister of Egypt. But his brother forgives. The brother forgives the brothers. And thus rescues the family. Jacob and the sons come and live in, in Egypt. And this is where we pick up the account in Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 1. So turn there in your Bibles. We're going to look at the first 14 verses. Uh, three scenes I want us to consider in this that really kind of really set us up for uh, how God wants to use this people, his people, Israel, in the context of a, of a foreign nation, uh, a foreign ruler, a foreign king whose name is Pharaoh, and I think there's a lot that is to be said about this that really pertains to our lives today. So I hope you're encouraged. I hope that you understand that there's a lot of timeless theological truths that are applicable to our lives, even today from such a, a wonderful history that goes back 3,500 years. So turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 1. Let's read it in, in its entirety, and then I'm going to go back and talk about the three points that I want to, I want to uh, talk about today. So verse 1 says, now there uh, these were the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, and uh, each one came with his own household. They were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. Pretty epic names, huh? I love them. And, and all the persons who came from his loins of Jacob were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. So that's all the history that I already got you up to speed with. And Joseph died. And all his brothers and, and all this generation. So Joseph and his family, all gone. They died. Jo Joseph was about 110 years old, the Bible says. And the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Circle that. That's a very ominous verse right there. It's setting us up for a, an arc in this, in this history that uh, it's not going to fare well for God's people. Verse 9, and then he said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and in the event of war they also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. So his plan wasn't working, as is the case when it comes to what God wants to do in and through his people, right? And the more they increase and the more they spread out, so they were in dread of the sons of Israel. This is just getting worse for Pharaoh, right? And the Egyptians, though compelled the sons of Israel to labor more vigorously or rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field and all their labors, which they rigorously imposed on them. May God write his eternal truths on our hearts this morning. Three things I want you to see as far as this, the arc of the narrative here. The first is this, because it, it all starts off really, really good, right? Israel's promise and Pharaoh's favor. So everything I've already told you about kind of what's culminating, culminated up to this moment in Exodus has been really a fulfillment of God's promise. God promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham these words. He says, Abraham, guess what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to call you to go forth from your country, 
and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I'm going to show you. You're going to go on an adventure, Abraham, and, and you've never been to this place before. It's going to be foreign territory, and I'm going to make a great nation of you. This is God's goal, to raise up a group of people. He's going to call them a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. See, God does something with his people. He blesses them so they can be a blessing to others. That's an important point we're going to flesh out a little bit more today. I will bless those who bless you because I love you and I want to protect you. So they who honor you, I'm going to guess what? I'm going to honor them. Whether they know me or not, I'm going to bless them. But those who dishonor you, I will curse. This is God's protective nature over his people. Right, That God is a God who sees his people and oftentimes sees how his people are mistreated and says, trust me, I will vindicate you. One day, all things that have been done as far as harm towards you, God will vindicate you. Here's the good news. You don't have to vindicate yourself. Right? You don't have to go out and be like uh, all vengeful and, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm gonna strike those who strike. Stop. This is not going to fare well for anybody involved in this, this situation. Let him defend you. Let him vindicate you. And he says, and all the families in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what we see is God fulfilling this because in Genesis, you see this God who is creating the world. In Exodus, you see the God who's creating a nation. He's creating a people. See, Genesis is about a family Abraham and that lineage, Exodus is about the nation that came from this family. And so there's two things we need to understand when it comes to the promise of God that are, I think it's important for us to understand is that there is a creation mandate that's tied up with God's promises. The creation mandate is literally this, be fruitful and multiply. Now that's not the first time we've read it there in Exodus chapter 1. Where do those words appear in our Bibles? Anyone? Just in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It goes back to Adam and Eve. And he says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. This is what we would call creation mandate that says this. God's plan of, of blessing the world is through being fruitful and multiplying. He is a God who wants you to flourish, and he's a God against anything that prevents human flourishing, which means something for us today as, is, as it meant something thousands of years, years ago. He will fully support any sort of union that produces flourishing, and he's against that which doesn't produce flourishing, which means God has set up the family in such a way where a man shall be joined with a woman, they shall come together in holy matrimony, and they shall have babies together. And anything that's contrary to that design is not fulfilling the mandate to, to be, be fruitful and multiply. To, to. So what we're espousing here is that anything that stands against the human family and flourishing is not on God's side. Now, let me, a little caveat. My wife and I, we understand people deal with infertility. People, there's couples who can't have kids. God understands that. We wrestled with that for almost 10 years in our, in our household. We, had a, we wrestled with God. All of our friends are having babies, and we're like, what's going on? I mean, well, having sex, that's a good start, right? So, you know, we, we got that. But there's nothing happening. And all of a sudden, almost 10 years into the journey, that point when you're just like, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm tired. I'm like... God, what are you doing? Not exhausted physically, exhausted spiritually. You know what I'm saying? Just like, what are you doing, God? And all of a sudden, God goes, now's the time. Boop, Lori's pregnant. And we're like, woohoo! And then all of a sudden, another one. And then all of a sudden, another one. Like, I want to keep this thing going. And my wife's like, listen, I'm approaching 40 years old. This is not going to be pretty, all right? I said, I'm good with three, right? So praise God, right? Praise God. If you are unable to have kids, God understands that. And there's other ways for you to be a parent, to be a mother, to be a father. Praise God for those opportunities. But we should understand as men and women, he has uniquely wired us, designed us for human flourishing. Anything that stands in the way of that, i.e. same-sex relationships, it doesn't produce that. I'm not discounting the fact that two, two men, two women can have love and affection for one another, but it is not according to God's design. 
And it's something that we need to stop and have conversations about. Just like protecting the life of, those who, of the unborn, those who don't have a voice. We need to be a voice for those who are voiceless. That we as a culture somehow have minimized the, the importance of, of, a, of a human life. That we care more about the bald eagle than we do about a human being who's created in the image of God. And we need to stop because any culture that prevents human flourishing from happening is a culture that will eventually implode on itself. Every culture of the world that has minimized or attacked the importance of marriage, commitment between a man and woman in the context of marriage to have babies, and therefore also treated either the old or the unborn, is a culture that will eventually destroy itself. And we need to be very clear on this. Because here's one thing, again, I I really ultimately don't care about are your feelings about things. I care about God's truth because here's what I do. I interact with people and they're like, but I feel so strongly about this. But you can't allow your feelings to go against God's created order, right? Thank goodness we still have a culture that somewhat holds our feelings and urges in check because if not, this would be a really whacked out place, right? Aren't you glad you just don't live out every proclivity of yours, every sensual desire of yours? This place would just be bacchanal on steroids. Can I get an amen on that? Some of you are like, I don't even know what he's talking about right now. But all I know is that we have a culture that has lost its pulse on any sort of semblance of self-control. That just because you deem it a fun thing or a thrilling thing or something you feel, doesn't mean it's the right thing. Doesn't mean it's the healthy thing. And so somehow we need to recognize that there is a designer who's given us the plans and the design and the owner's manual to, to how we're to conduct ourselves. That is the living God of the universe who's made himself known through the scriptures. Because how dare I buy a new car and then all of a sudden, because I feel like it, I don't want to put gas in it. I want to put milk in it. How far is that car going to run on milk? And, and, and it's not. I mean, Shamrock might be interested that this guy in Chandler's put a lot of milk in his car, right? Like, but eventually that car is not going to run. Why? Because it wasn't designed to run on milk. It was designed to run on gas. You are not designed to live life however you want. You are designed to live life according to the creator's design. Which then bridges us to the second point that there's a consecration mandate. Because of this ownership, your body is not your body. Your life is not your life. Your relationship with your wife, your relationship with your husband, your relationship is not yours. They're entrusted to you, but they're entrusted to you with a set of rules that say, if you do these things as as God has designed them, it will work out well, flourishing. (laughs) But if not, it's going to be disastrous. This is why the people of Israel multiplied like crazy. Because they also understood that they're a set-apart people. Point number two, the consecration mandate. See, God has not only told you to be fruitful and multiply, the most important thing he's called you to be is set apart. You're to be different. See, Joseph ended up in Egypt and didn't convert to the Egyptian religion. He didn't adopt the Egyptian practices. He was a man who remained faithful to who he is in God from Canaan, but he still had an impact and influence, write those two words down in your notes, impact and influence in his culture, even though his culture was totally foreign and held to different values. Here's what's tough, friends, is to live in a culture that doesn't share the same values you do. What's difficult, though, is that even though the culture may not agree with some of your decisions, some of your ethics, some of your morals, There's this consecration mandate that says you still live as one who's owned by Christ. You still live as salt and light in an an oftentimes tasteless place, (laughs) dark place. If you think about it, Joseph, oh my goodness, he had this position of privilege and he didn't want to squander his privilege and his position. He was used mightily of God and yet remained faithful to his God in a context that so didn't want his God. They reap the benefits of his consecration. See, ladies and gentlemen, you and I as followers of Christ, as believers in Christ, you exist in a foreign context. 
not to go live in isolation, not to go live in some sort of Christian bubble. You were designed to live in the context of people who don't worship the same God you worship, who don't hold to the same values you do, but you're still called to impact and influence them. This is where Joseph was, and God blessed Joseph there. See, Joseph held the promises of God dearly to his heart. And because he did this, he found favor. You and I can find favor with people who don't worship the same God we worship. I tell you, that's such a po- that's to be so positively to the presence of Christians in, in our world, right? Like this week, all right, literally, I'm going to share two stories with you. These two stories happen within five minutes of each other. I'm going to share the second story first. So I'm coming off the first story with this high. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But I'm sitting where Brian is. Brian, raise your hand. Uh, ahead of our finance team. Yay! He's going to be helping us lead uh, the state of the church meeting today. So that's Brian. Um, I'm over there with Brian, and a customer comes in who I've known for about 10 years. And this customer doesn't know Jesus, and we've had some great conversations with each other. He knows I'm a pastor, and we've gone kind of toe-to-toe and talking about ethics and morals and values and worldviews and, oh, man, all sorts of stuff. This is a smart guy who has been hurt by Christians. But we, we're still friends, and um, it's so cool. He comes in this week, and he sits down, and, in, and the first thing out of his mouth is, um, my wife and I spent about five minutes talking about you last night. I'm like, oh, this is going to be interesting, right? Like, do tell, please. And he says, yeah, we turned on the TV, and there was this guy on there named Joel Osteen. And then I'm going, where's this thing going, right? Like, oh, I got to go. I got to take a call or something, right? Like, and now again... Uh, he didn't know who Joel Osteen was, but I'll tell you what, within a few minutes, he got to know who Joel Osteen was. Full disclosure, I'm not a big fan. Uh, I question theo- his theology. I think he preaches a half gospel, a diet Jesus. It's not healthy. But in a sense, like Paul says in Philippians 1, you know what? If someone's preaching Christ, and I don't necessarily agree with how they're preaching Christ, who am I? <laughs> We'll let God sort all that in the end, right? But that doesn't mean we can't test one another and examine one another, see where we're at, right? So he says, and it's two or three minutes into Joel Osteen, who he's never seen before. He did a little Google search. He's like, oh, this guy's a real, he's a real cupcake, isn't he? (laughs) I said, yeah, cupcake. Um, He goes, I turned to my wife and said, I thank God that Scott Morgan is not like this guy. And I go, do tell. I said, I know my teeth aren't as pearly white. (laughs) That's what cigars and coffee will get you, (laughs) right? Like, (laughs) Um, but he said, here's a guy who my first impression is, give me money. Look at this, look at this palace I've built. Look how shiny my teeth are. Look how nice my suit is, right? He goes, the thing I love and respect about Scott is that he's just he's the real deal. Like, he's a guy that is here, we can talk, he's open about his life, and he just, like, th- that moment when you feel like, am I making a difference? God puts someone like that and says, thank you for being you. I may not uh, subscribe to your faith, I may not worship your God, but you know what? Thank you for being somebody who I think is truer to the spirit of, of, of Jesus than this guy. And I was just like, oh man, God, thanks, I needed that, I needed that. I wonder who else feels this way that's in your life about you, right? Like, the the last thing I want to hear is, oh, so-and-so is a believer? Oh, man, I wish they, good riddance. I don't want them in my life anymore. I don't want that to be said of you. I want people to come to me and go, you know what I know about Brianna? I know what I know about Alan is that they're good people. Like, they're spiritual, they're religious, whatever word you want to use. All I know is that they're, they're the nicest people. They're just the most respectful people. They're the most... Je- May our tribe increase in that. Right? See, God doesn't hold you accountable to convert somebody. He does that. But He holds you accountable as far as your conduct with all people. And all I know is that Je- Joseph's in Egypt, and he is just honoring God, and he is finding favor with Pharaoh, and God's blessing him, and I, and I want that to be true of us, amen, church, I want that to be true of us, but sometimes things change, <laughs> point number two, Israel's prosperity and Pharaoh's fear, 
So something happens here in the account. Look at this. So Joseph dies, all his brothers in that generation, but the sons of Israel were fruitful and multiplying, right, and became exceedingly mighty so that the, the land was filled with them. Just so you know, 70 people came into Egypt initially. Two million are led out in the Exodus. There's a lot of baby making going on. whole lot of baby making going on, right? Like you can hear all of singing that, right? All right, so, so Pharaoh is now introduced. Verse 8, a new king comes to power over Egypt who does not know Joseph. These are haunting words because anything good that Joseph was able to impart in this culture seems like, yeah, we, we have no understanding of that. There's this lingering presence of something, but we, we don't know him. And what's unfortunate is that not only there's this Pharaoh who knows not Joseph, but I think the people of Israel also begin to not know Joseph. Something happens. Verse 9, look at this. Pharaoh says, behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. You know what I hear in that? Fear. You know what I hear in that? Insecurity. As is what happens with new administrations come into power. When there's new presidents, new, new CEOs, new owners, right? New, new kings, new captains, right? All of a sudden, you start to see things which may or may not be real. Yeah, they were, being, they were multiplying, right? They were, they were numerous among the Egyptians. Whether they outnumbered the Egyptians, that's yet to be known. But all of a sudden, insecurity. Be careful of an insecure leader. Be careful of someone who rises to power who leads by fear. Because what happens is they start perpetuating propaganda that is oftentimes less real and more imaginary. Because look what happens, verse 10. Come, let us deal wisely with them. So he goes, we have to do something about their increase, their presence. Lest they multiply and in the event of war, join themselves with another nation and hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So number one, the fear is we're going to lose our workforce. <laughs> and number two, they could join forces with somebody else, and we'll lose Egypt. Now, here's the question. Has Israel demonstrated any sort of activity that would say we're anti-Egypt? No, but this is where fear does. It capitalizes on your insecurity. And oftentimes, when an insecure leader leads by fearful propaganda, it leads to nothing but brutal and beast-like behavior. Some of you are going, hmm, sounds kind of like our culture today. It does. Because we live at such a precipice in our culture where it's now less about the character of a leader and it's more about how much excitement they can stir. And often that excitement is based upon lies and things that are imaginary, not true. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do better. We can love better. We can lead better, right? There's this Pharaoh who knows, knows not Joseph nor his character, his conduct. There's a people called Israel who knows not Joseph and his character and conduct. That's why we have the writings of Exodus. Because I think, too, the reason we see the shift here in this account is that perhaps because Israel is going to be in Egypt for how many years? 400 years. Look at Genesis 15. Reminder, God's already told the arc of the events that are going to happen. Hundreds of years before this event, look what happens with uh, Abraham in Genesis 15. The Lord says to Abram, know for certain that your offspring shall be sojourners in a land that's not theirs, i.e. Israel and Egypt. God's already predicted this. And will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for... Now, I don't want to sign up for affliction for four minutes. Amen? Anyone else signing up for this? Like, okay, God, I'm in, right? No, I'm not. But just so you know, for 400 years you're going to be afflicted. You know what happens when 400 years of affliction happens? You forget about your God. 
you forget about the importance of your presence in a culture that's foreign to God, that's hostile to God. You're in a context where your, cult, your, your, your values in Christ clash with the values of that culture. 400 years, you will be afflicted, but that's not the end. I will bring judgment on that nation. The battle belongs to the Lord. Amen? No power will be able to stand against the power of our God. I will bring judgment on that nation, and they shall serve, that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possession. So, we know the end of all of this. God is a delivering God. God is a victorious God, right? Why are we so mournful? Why are we so hopeless? God is a delivering God. Even though he says, I'm not going to spare you from affliction, I'm going to allow you to go through affliction, and I'm not going to have you trust circumstances, I'm going to have you trust Christ. But know that the afflictions will not go on forever. Isn't that good to hear? Number one, our momentary afflictions are nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. What you are going through right now will not last forever. God is a God who is a delivering God. He's a rescuing God. He's a God who says, whatever you go through and whoever you go through it that's against you, I'm against them. I will vindicate. Trust me, it's all going to work out okay. <laughs> Better than okay. It's going to work out awesome. So the people need to be reminded of this because Egypt is not the promised land. Right? These people are in Goshen, which is the most fertile place in Egypt. These people are there, but they're not longing for Canaan anymore. Can I encourage you with something, church? This world is not your home. You're passing through. You're sojourners, you're exiles, you're aliens. You were never made for Egypt. You were made for the promised land. Here's what I'm praying, that your spiritual hearing would continue to hear the voice of your God say, you're almost home. That you hear your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ say, I go and prepare a place for, for you, and I'm not far away from coming back to take you and to be where I am. Right? We need to be reminded of this because as our values in Christ clash with the values of our culture, sometimes we can lose sight of what's really important. And especially when there's opposition, like a guy named Pharaoh, right? A couple things I want to just navigate with you real quick. Is, it, it's this, and, and these should be givens, right? Number one, change is to be expected. So the fact that perhaps Israel's wrestling with new leadership, uh, kings rise, kings fall. Nations rise, nations fall. Change. I, my favorite quote about change is by Mark Twain, who... He's an interesting guy, great sense of humor. He says, the only one that likes change is a wet baby, right? So, like, <laughs> bravo, Mark. Like, it's true. None of us like change, but it happens. And we get so, like, right? There's a new administration, right? New administration means new taxes, new policies, new laws, new legislation, right? And we all wrestle with this, for better or for worse, right? None of us like anything new, and especially when it's new and it's against stuff that we value and we cherish, but as circumstances and culture changes, number one, expect it. But number two, no matter what happens, there's one thing that's to be constant, and that is your obedience to God. See, obedience to God always has an advantage over any opposition from an enemy. The spirit, the dynamic, the environment may change. But the thing that's going to be constant in our hearts is that no matter what happens, I will be allegiant to my God. Daniel, exiled from his home. Change, yes. Given new name, given new education, given new diet, right? Here's Daniel in this foreign context. One thing he did not want to do is go against his affection and allegiance to God. And God blessed him in that context. See, ladies and gentlemen, you are called to be who you are in Christ no matter what happens in the culture. And that may get better for you. That may get worse for you. But nothing changes your obedience to him. Because Israel is about to go, undergo a reordering of their social place in this, this culture. They're going from being the darlings, like, aren't they great? We're just so glad they're here, to now they're intimidating. Now they're rising up. And now they may be against us and not for us. Fear sets in. Things are going to radically change, and it's going to become more painful. Lest you think you're going to go through life as a believer pain-free, you have bought into the wrong gospel. Can I just tell you that 
one of God's main means of sanctifying you is to allow you to go through painful processes. Embrace the suck. <laughs> Embrace the pain. Can I, how many of us here have gone through painful processes, have come through them, and have learned so much more about your God and yourself that those painful processes would have taught you? Amen? Our God is a God who does not allow needless suffering to happen to his kids. Everything we go through, for better or for worse, is going to tell us something about our God and about ourselves for his glory and our good. Okay? So they're about ready to go through something that they're not perhaps anticipating, which brings me to my second point. Certainty is to be redirected. Because I will tell you, there is nothing certain in life except the character of God and his promises. What does that mean? It means the essence of a believer's life is not certainty, it is trust. Write that word down, trust. Because how many of you have had things that you thought were certain become uncertain? And you're like, what am I left with? I'll tell you what you're left with as a believer. You're left with a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is unchanging, who is ever constant, constant in giving himself, constant in showing love, and constant in saying, no matter what you go through, I will be there. If it's through the fire, I'm there. If it's through the water, I'm there. If it's through the storm, I'm there. If it's through the peaceful desert, I'm there. Just know, feast or famine, I am your God, and I will never leave you or forsake you. And yet... We allow our hearts to get all weirded out because oh, my circumstances have changed. And God says they're not certain. I, your God, am a ever constant, never changing lover of your soul. Trust me. Bank your life on my promises. You're, you're going to weather this. Stop trusting in things that they were never meant for you to trust in. <laughs> Can't get an amen, right? Like, governments change, right? It happens. And so, whether we're experiencing changes at work, changes in our family, death happens, and all of a sudden our life is like so uncertain. Right? As a 15-year-old, I never thought I was going to lose my mom at age 39. She was 39. My family went into this tailspin. That God somehow, through it all, proved himself to be so good and faithful. I mean, whatever you're dealing with, whatever, your marriage is not what you thought. You end up, you know, a year ago, you never thought you were divorced. Here you are divorced. I, we're not here to judge. We're not here to condemn. We all have things uncertain happen. The key is, may we be a community that says, we will not allow you to spiral in despair. And spiral in devastation. And spiral in depression. But we will come alongside of you and say, yeah, though your marriage may have, you thought it was going to be certain, and it ended up being not certain, there's one thing that is ever constant, and that is your God loves you. Boy, we need to hear that. Because there's, there's this entity that exists that is really, it knows the promises of God, but is intent on making sure you don't know the promises of God, and his name's Satan. You know who knows the promises of God than you do? The devil. And you know what he's trying to do, and he's been doing this from the very beginning, trying to get you distracted to trust in things other than him. Wow. He believes, but he doesn't believe in a salvific way. The demons believe God and shudder. That's what James says. But we, who are created in God's image, are given the capacity to believe, but not to shudder, but to trust. And so discount the work of the enemy who's trying to sow seeds of devastation and despair and trust the God who says, listen to my voice. Sometimes the devil has a louder voice than God does. And it's easy for us to go, okay, I'm going to listen, right? No, you've got to quiet it. So that you can get to that whisper of God that so often is speaking. Amen, church? Last point is this. So now the, the temperature is going to increase, 
right? There's Israel's persecution and Pharaoh's fury. Look what happens. So, again, you have this leader, Pharaoh, who is insecure. It is always disastrous to be under the leadership of an insecure leader. I, mean, I can think of a lot of leaders in our culture that are, that are insecure. Uh, all of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> They're all insecure, and be careful of an insecure leader. They will destroy. They will lead by uh, imaginary propaganda. They'll create things that are not real and uh, just cause a, a nation to spiral. And don't worry, I'm very much for our culture. I'm very much for our nation. I, I love the fact that we're here. But I think we have to really temper how much faith we put in government. We should be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, right, according to the teachings of Matthew. And in an election year, you better believe I'm going to help steer the church in an appropriate way to understand politics. Government is given to us as a gift from God, Romans chapter 13, as an agent of ministry. But that doesn't mean it's, it's perfect. That doesn't mean it's, you know, fail-proof. But it means that we as Christians can come to the table and be less recognized by our party affiliation and more recognized because the Spirit of Christ dwells in us. Can I get an amen, church? That's the way we're going to go forward. So I'm not Republican and I'm not Democrat. I'm, Jesus. I'm for Jesus. Okay? Republicans have a lot to learn. Democrats have a lot to learn. In the end, are the spirit of both parties want what's best for people? Yes! How they're going about it is wrong. On both sides. And we're forced to get into extreme beliefs and situations. I'm going to say, church, slow down. I'll be the pastor. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I'm going to tell you how to vote. I'm going to tell you how to exercise this opportunity to be a voice, your responsibility as a citizen of this great nation. How you can honor God and still be a part of political parties. Whoa, pray for me in that because I'm praying for myself. And all I know is my kitchen table with my kids is always an adventurous time talking about this topic. So I'm surprised I'm not out in the streets yet. <laughs> we don't want dad at the table anymore. All right, uh, Israel's persecution, Pharaoh's fear. So look what happens. So they're multiple, they may multiply themselves again. It wasn't real, it was imaginary. Uh, but instead of them stopping and multiplying, you know, being fruitful and multiply, they continue to increase. I think Pharaoh's thinking if we keep them busy with work, they're not going to have enough time making babies. But what's fun is that they had time to make babies and they kept growing, right? That's awesome. So they're this, this baby-making nation, and they were just continuing to grow, and all of a sudden there's dread. That word dread came about, and Pharaoh just said, we need to put a kibosh to this. We're going to stop. Let's make their work harder. And then they began to really fear the fury of this insecure leader. You know what this looks like? This is, this is, this is discrimination. And I want you to think through what's happening here. Because what we see in this text is that fear turns into hate, then then turns into subjugation. Or to put it another way, it is prejudice that turns into persecution that turns into genocide ultimately. Jeez, does that sound like some other events that happen in human history? Some not too far long ago. Some even currently happening in other nations. The moment you start thinking of people as a category and not as a human being is disastrous. First conversation I had five minutes before the other one. I'm over there where Audrey is. Because I moved seats. Audrey, raise your hand. So I was, start, I was where Audrey was and I ended up where Brian's at. Some guy comes up to me this week and says, are you the owner? And I always say, maybe. Because you never know, right? Like, <laughs> is it good? I'm the owner. Is it bad? It's on whoever's working behind the bar, right? It's Dave. I'm going to blame Davey, right? So I said, maybe. We kind of laughed, right? And he says, um, I want you to know um, I have a child who's trans, and they meet with friends here, and I want you to know how much I appreciate you providing a safe place for them. Now, some are like, did you come out and tell them, like, where'd you go wrong as a parent, right? Like, what? no, because that's not my spirit. I said, you know what? Thank you. I said, that really communicates the, the essence of, like, we want to be a place where everyone can come together, right? It doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, what, what sort of sexuality you practice, whatever. I have my opinions on those things. But I'm not going to prevent people from being... He goes, I want you to know how much I appreciate you providing a place for my, my, my child. 
And then he looked down, I'm wearing my Count Zinzendorf shirt. It's got a big cross on it. It says, preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. If you don't have a Count Zinzendorf shirt yet, 15 bucks, I can get you one. All right? So uh, he looks at my shirt and he goes, are you, a, are you a religious man? I said, I'm a man of faith, love Jesus. He goes, can I give you a hug? We haven't exchanged names. But I hug him. And then he proceeds to walk away. And he goes, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to have another conversation about what you've done here. I said, I would love that. Love to have that conversation. All I know, and this took place less than a minute, but how much information was given to me at that moment made me stop and go, okay, Here's a dad who's raising a trans child. Whatever you, whatever you believe about that, okay, whatever. But then he goes, but you're a Christian. You're a man of faith. What I heard him say when he said he wanted to hug me was, perhaps he's never encountered somebody who is a Christian who's maybe been nice, been kind, Maybe been judgmental, been condemning. I don't know. But all I know is that him raising a trans child and me being a person of faith, he wanted a hug. And I'm thinking to myself, I want us to be the kind of people that the world goes, we already know what you're against. We want to know what you're for. Because we're good about telling people what we're against. Because we love that. Just, yeah, I hate this and can't stand it. Like, stop. What are you for? And here's what I hope you're for. The spirit of Christ being present in your life where even your enemies want to hug you. Even those who differ on any theological, moral, ethical, want to hug you. Because, again, it is your, not your job to convince and convert. It is your job to conduct yourselves in such a way that somehow the Gentiles will glorify your God. Matthew chapter 5. That you're living as salt and light in such a way that maybe a second conversation you can get into the weeds about what you believe and why you believe it. But at the start, allow that door to open instead of close it right away. Some of us are good about saying, I'm going to stop this conversation right now because you're a category and you're not a human. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what sinners do well? They sin. Can I get an amen? You know what sinners who don't know Jesus do well? They sin in darkness and with blindness. You come to the table assuming people have all these convictions that are right in line with yours in Christ. They don't. They were bl they're blind just like you were blind, but now you see. Don't force their blindness down their throat. Be the one who has vision. Show them the light. Stop being divisive and seek unity and harmony. Because here's what I know God's not going to do. Welcome to heaven one day. I'm so glad you debated that guy and really crushed his worldview. You know what God's going to say? Thank you for giving a, the account of the hope that's in you with gentleness and respect. Wow. All I know, guys, is that we have done a horrible job of treating people as categories than human. And we need to stop. We need to stop for fear of whatever. Right? Deep down inside, the reason we don't treat people as human is because there's a fear that lies within us. And I don't know what that fear is. <gasps> They're going to take over. <laughs> Who's they? I don't know. Whatever your they is. But all of a sudden, we fall into this self-protectionism, and we need to be reminded that God's got us. He's got a, a, a new country waiting for us. This is not our home. And whether the laws of the land are in agreement with you or not, it's all going to come to pass. There's going to be one king and one kingdom that's going to reign forever. I'm on Jesus' side. I have a peace about that. We're good to go. Can I get an amen? 
So, in closing, four things to consider that are actually, believe it or not, the teachings of Christ. And, you know, once in a while you should pay attention to Jesus. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Here we go. Number one, you're in the world. You're here. <laughs> you had no choice to be here. You're here. Praise God you're here. You are evidence of a God who has such creative ability, it blows our minds. You, re you realize men and women trying to f figure out humanity forever? <laughs> They'll never get to it. Why? Because it, this is all in the creator's hands. You're here. So we're in the world. Accept that. Accept the fact that you're in a world that oftentimes is, is not necessarily uh, for you, right? You're, you're, you're a foreigner. You're an alien, right? So second point is this, is that you're not of the world, right? So you're here, but yet this is not your home, right? We're not of this world. We're not defined by this world. We're defined by God. This is such an important identity point, right? Allow your le life to be less defined by Fox News and more defined by the Holy Scriptures, can I get an amen? amen? Your favorite personality, your favorite podcast. Like, you're allowing a lot of things to define you that, that God is basically trying to get in to define you because all these other things that are defining you are going to lead you to destruction. Only one can define you, and that is God. He's your creator. He's your maker. Consult the owner's manual. <laughs> you're not of this world. You're to live your life with different ethics, different morals, different pursuits. You're to look different than your coworker. You're to look different than your neighbor, but in a good way, a, a way that elicits conversation. So you're not of this world. Your, your hope is not here. It's there. Set for yourselves, you know, treasures in heaven, right? You are seated in the heavenly places in Christ, right? Your, your, your citizenship is a heavenly one, right? There's Colossians 3. There's Philippians chapter 3. Boom, read it this week. Get more happy about your eternal home than this home. Number three is this. We are sent to the world. The, the fact that God has awakened you to the beauty of Jesus Christ means you are now to live a life not only enjoying your God, your creator, but having other people come into that enjoyment of God as well. Your mission as a human that is redeemed by Christ is understand your sentness into a world that doesn't have salt and doesn't have light. You are sent to the world. Why? Because the world is in despair. The world is hopeless. The world is blind. The world is directionless. The world is trying to live by wisdom, and it's only destroying itself. And boy, the, the, and this was on my radar, but the great C.S. Lewis said this. This is what Christianity brings to the table that no other world religion can is because it has the most accurate view of reality more than anything else. Why? Because Lewis says, I believe in Christianity like I believe the sun has risen, not because I see it, but by it I see everything else. Christianity, you begin to go, oh, now it makes sense. Now I understand. Without Christ, there's only blindness. With Christ, there is an awareness and a sight that you are now to share. You're to invite people into. So there's that sense that we're sent into the world. Moses is going to have this task of helping people see what is unseen. Help people understand what is seemingly meaningless or unimportant. Last point is this. We are hated by the world. And Christ said, if the world hated me, they're going to hate you as well. And again, we don't return hate for hate, which uh, Christians sometimes think they have a spiritual gift. Like, no, it's my spiritual gift to hate the world. No. You are to live in a context, though, you are hated, you love in response. He was reviled and didn't revile in return. He was uh, treated horribly. He didn't treat others horribly in return. Read 1 Peter chapter 2. That's where that talks about that. Jesus was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He could have brought down so many legions of angels and took care of his enemies, but he didn't. Why? Because he would be the God who would contradict himself to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So you know what you do? You love and lead with the gospel. You may be mistreating me. I'm going to love you and forgive you. That's the spirit of Christ. When the world's 
values clash with your values as one in Christ, do not think there's going to be difficulties. But be hopeful, believer. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Be hopeful, believer, that the battle belongs to the Lord. He's got this. He just wants you, as you go through it, to look to him, right? His character. Hold cl closely to his promises, his word. And when you do that, he will be that anchor through the most severe of storms. Because here is the best news of all. There's one who's gone before us. His name is Jesus. Afflicted, crushed, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, who went to the cross, died a criminal's death, perfect, spotless, didn't deserve that treatment, but he endured it for us, buried, risen again. Now he is a forerunner of our faith, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, though he had the cross before him, understood the crown that lay beyond it. And he invites you to trust him as well. If you cling to Jesus and keep your heart pressed into who he is and where he's at and what he's done, you will not falter. You will not be crushed. You will be ever hopeful because greater is him who's in you than he who's in the world. And all the church said, amen. amen. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for today. Thank you for being so good, for giving us a, a, a song on our lips to sing. How good are you? Wow. It's so true. To give us time to connect with one another, to see familiar faces, to meet new ones. Lord, I pray that the spirit of love and, and just um, just acceptance is here, that the spirit of Christ is present, a welcoming, warm, gracious spirit, a kind spirit. Thank you for your word, Lord, Lord that instructs us. Lord, it guides our steps. Lord, uh, probably the biggest thing that I'm just, I'm pressing into right now as I, I think about this is I don't want to take my sights off of you. Lord, the moment I do, the moment I get all conflicted inside, um, Lord, thank you that you are the God of peace and you bring forth a peace whose mind is stayed on you. We want that peace. Help us to trust. Help us to look to you. Help us to cling to your promises. And no matter what we may be going through, help us to hear that still, small voice. I will never leave you or forsake you. Thank you for being such a good God, for giving us this time together. Be glorified in our lives. Help us to point others to Jesus. And Lord, thank you for just being our God. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you more. Lord, lift his face towards you and give his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen.